This is a 16 mil steam back viewing machine. On this machine you can view separate picture and separate sound and combined optical sound and combined magnetic sound. So now I'm going to lace the steam back with a 16 mil print and sound. And first of all, this is the print. Just in there. And you'll notice that the print has um, perforations along the bottom edge and we have sprockets which go into these perforations. This is a fairly simple operation with the print. We ru machine runs through onto a core on the other side. So now we're ready to run the print through to the gate. The gate is a cross symbol and there it is. So I'm going to put a brake on that and hold that there. And now we'll get the sound. Slightly more complicated operation, more rollers and there is a sound head that has we have to pass over. So first of all it goes around a roller and then perforations and sprockets making sure that the film runs across the head. You do the same on the other side and then onto another core. So we've, we're holding the print as you can see, I'm just going to run the sound through and there's the equivalent on this. So we're looking for a gate again. And then we got them together. I can take the break off the print and now they'll run together. The leader is six feet long or nine seconds and 15 frames and I'm going to run this through to the first frame. zero there, first frame, and ready to play. <laughs> well, I met this girl and uh, I said, are you free tonight? She said, no, but I'm reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> she said, do you want a bit on the side? I said, I didn't know they'd moved it, but still work. <laughs> So I mentioned earlier, um, there is a Comops and a Comag. Um, so I'm going to put a Comag onto the machine now. And the Comag is a print with a mag track running along the top edge. Um, originally used in news gathering. Um, as with an ordinary print, we run it exactly the same way to the lamp. The perforations at the bottom. The sprockets go through the perforations. And at this point, it takes a slightly different path up to the Comag head. So we go outside and inside these rollers. And at this point, I'm going to change the to the Comag head. Um, just another cross there. And then around that roller and onto the core. And we just run that down to the first frame. And I'll run that down to the first frame. Oh, zero there. As you can see, 
there's the comag running along the top. So, and down here, this is a fader for the comag, so I'm going to bring that up and we're ready to go. Okay, and now um, I'm going to lace up a optical combined optical track. Um, so now I'm going to lace up a Comopt print, and as with the others, the perforations. I'll just turn the lamp on. The perforations at the bottom, so we just match those up with the sprockets. And um, same lace with the comag. That's the comag, and but we move the comop head round into play. Optical head. That's slightly nearer the lamp. It's 26 frames in advance. Making sure that it's not too tight. Round another roll there for a bit more tension onto the core and uh, we're rolling. So now I'm going to run it down to the first frame. Okay, that's approximately the first frame, so I'm going to zero there for a reference and run back slightly and as you see there, there's the Comopt signal running across the top of the film and over on this side um, there's the fader, so we'll bring that fader up and we're ready to play These are scratches on the base side of the film, otherwise known as tram line scratches, because usually there's more than one. And this is an emulsion scratch. As you can see, the, it's gone into the colours on the side of the emulsion. These sometimes are difficult to repair, and usually can be repaired by transferring the film to tape using a wet gate method. Wet gate fills in the um, damage. And here we have a film with um, a bad case of mould. Um, and this can be caused by certain storage conditions. Um, and as you can see, um, it's fungal and a bit powdery. This condition also affects soundtracks, and here we have an example. Um, the fungus has started to break out here, here. Um, mag tracks can be cleaned by the ultrasonic process. Before the film rewashing or polishing process can take place, all film must be checked for damage and all cement splices backed up on the base side and all tape joins remade on both sides with waterproof tape. The film must be prepared same side out, all emulsion or all base, whether negative or positive, and whatever the geometry, MP, also called DIN, or SMPTE. During the polishing process, only the base side of the film is polished. For film rewashing, 
the film is loaded onto a purpose-built dual-gauge rewash machine and run through a rewash bath. This causes the emulsion to swell. When the film emulsion contracts again upon drying, any fine to medium emulsion scratches will close up. This process is more effective with thicker emulsion stocks, usually colour. Following this process, the film would be ultrasonically cleaned to remove dirt and dust prior to polishing or transfer. For film polishing, the film is run over a glass wheel and any base scratches are filled in with acetone, which recontours the sharp edges of the scratches, rendering them invisible during projection, scanning or printing. Constant speed must be maintained at all times for this application to be successful. Then if necessary, the film is rejoined back to its original geometry. Finally, the film is ultrasonically cleaned again to remove any dirt or dust built up during this process. What we're going to do here is show you how to lace up the Steenbeck machine and what we're looking for um, before any of this material is transferred are making sure that the material is in a fit state to be transferred, if there are any problems, if the sink is out and I'll show you some of the uh, operation of how we lace the film up and uh, the various things that we do when we're running the film. We've got um, aspect ratio we can change if we've got widescreen films or normal ratio. We've got um, a time code setting if we want to have um, a VHS copy made with a time code. We can run the picture separately. This is a picture head and this is a sound head, a mag head, and we can run the mag separately. So we can run them together or individually um, stop one and then run the other. And the button here will be for racking the film. Right, we're going to lace up the film now. I'll start off with the picture material. Um, what you have to be very careful is that you're actually going around the correct rollers because if you don't, you can end up scratching the film. And one of the common mistakes that is made is that you can run the film through one of the hard edges, say, of the the mag pickup here and end up seriously scratching the material. So what I've got here is a, running it through the separate picture head. You could run here if you had a combined print, but we're actually going to be running a separate picture. So I'm going through the rollers. Right, I'm now going to lace up the mag track so the first thing I'm going to do is make sure that the picture is switched off so that when I run the machine the picture won't run forward. And then when lacing up the mag we have to make sure that the tension is nice and taut otherwise you'll get distortion to the sound. So I'll just pull the perforation through and here you can see where the actual mag head is but it's nice and tight. You've got the rollers here that'll take up the tension. I mean, you don't want it too tight that you're actually going to be almost stretching the film. But if it's too loose, then you'll be getting a sort of a wow and a distortion here. So I'll just gently ease the film through onto the uh, film bobbin, pushing it through and taking it up, and there you go. Now, some people maybe who aren't that experienced with lacing films onto bobbins will use tape. Not a good idea. If you put tape on the bobbin and then when the film has been run and then wound backwards, it can actually be quite tight and sometimes snap the film even. So don't use tape. You can push it through the little areas that are cut in the uh, bobbin or core, but I mean, you should actually get used to doing it. I'll just show you what I did again. Just place it round, let it go through gently. Got my thumb against the core, and there it is. Right, the next thing I'm going to do is get the picture and the soundtrack in sync. So I'm going to be looking for the sync marks. So I'm now going to turn the picture on so it'll run with the mag, run it through, and then I'm going to be looking for the um, sync marks. The other thing also is to check that it's in rack. Now this button here will do the rack and if you look on the screen you'll see that the picture is rolling. Now it's in rack, so I'll leave it in the correct position. And here comes the sync mark. You can actually ease them through if you wish by hand, and I'll do that when I get to the mag track. So I'm going to lock off the picture, 
There I have the sync mark for the picture. And I'm going to run the mag track until I get the sync mark for the mag. Just watching out for it. It's just coming through here. So there's a cross for the sync mark. I'm going to stop it on the mag head. You can actually also, by doing that, ease it backward and forward until you get the exact position. So I've got the sync mark on the mag head. Lock it off. Sync mark for the picture. And I'll lock that off. So now the mag and the picture will run together in sync. We've previously looked at a separate picture and a separate mag track. Now we're going to look at a combined print, which uh, is sometimes called a com-op. So I shall lace it up. And what we have, we lace up the picture. And then I'm going to go through the sound head. And we go through a sprocket drive here because it keeps the film nice and taut. If you didn't go through this one here, you can get some distortion on the sound. And then here we have the exciter lamp which plays on the soundtrack of the film. So our soundtrack is actually running through the sound head here. And that's probably why this year's affair was bigger and better than ever before. The fancy dress theme was hunting, shooting and fishing. And it seemed that half the country was there. There are many colour systems in use, but two of the most common systems are uh, Eastman colour and Technicolor. Um, now with Technicolor, in the very early days, they used to shoot what were called separation negatives, which were black and white negatives, and these were called yellow, cyan and magenta, and they were in a three-strip camera, shot as black and white, and then they would end up with a colour print. So from these YCM negs, they used to make what was called a matrix, and then dyes used to be pressed onto the finished stock. Now the type of films that would have been made in Technicolor would have been uh, Robin Hood for instance made in the mid 30s. A lot of these sort of typical 30s and 40s films which were Technicolor prints. Uh, these were also called imbibition prints and the essential thing is that they were a dye transfer system. Now after they stopped using the separation negatives, which was YCM negs with a three-strip camera, they then shot on Eastman colour negative, which was 1951 onwards, but they still made the dye transfer prints. So they were still made with the three, strip, uh, with the three colours on the prints, although the negatives were then colour negs. Now the advantage of Technicolor is that the prints never faded. Um, but when we talk about Eastman colour, if you look at an Eastman colour print typically from the 60s or the 70s, they're often faded to what looks like a magenta colour because the dyes were unstable and um, they just used to fade and the magenta was predominantly the colour that remained. And this didn't happen with Technicolor. So the other uh, way to dis 
distinguish between a Technicolor and an Eastman color is that if you look at the soundtrack, on a Technicolor print, the soundtrack is always gray and white or dark gray and white. Whereas on an Eastman color print, the soundtrack will be a dark blue and white. Right, with normal 35mm film, there's four perforations between each frame line. And what I'm going to show you here is how we can correct where a film has actually gone out of rack, where the distance between the frame lines is, say, two perfs or three perfs or five perfs. Now, to do this, we have two types of splices which are most commonly used. The most common one is actually this one, which has the width of splicing tape is four perfs wide. This one has much wider splicing tape, which is eight perfs wide. And this is much better because when you use this splicing tape, you can actually splice from frame line to frame line. You're actually covering two frames and you're not actually having the tape coming through the middle of the picture. When you use this one, unfortunately, when you actually do a join, the tape will actually come through the middle of the frame. But I'll show you now how we do a splice. Now, on this uh, frame line here, there's two perfs which I'm going to cut and remove. So with this splicer, I'll trim the two perfs away. And then I shall join it onto the frame line there. So I'm actually joining that onto that. Sometimes it can be a little bit more difficult when you're wearing gloves. And for the sake of uh, the film, I should only tape it on one side. Well, no, I'll do it both sides. I'll do it properly. I turn it round. Some people only tape on one side, but we'll do it properly and do it on both. So that's with the four perf splicing tape. And what actually happens is that the that's where the splice is and the tape goes right through the middle of that frame and the tape goes right through the middle of that frame there. And unfortunately with that splicing tape there's nothing you can do about it. But when we use this much better splicer with the eight perf splicing tape, I'll just make a, a join and I can join them both together. So I'm going to join that frame to that frame now, when I actually do this splice, on the frame line, you'll see that the actual splicing tape, the splicing tape covers right up on the frame line, and then right again up against the frame line there, over those two frames, so that none of the actual tape is shown in the frame. And when that's shown, you won't see that there was any tape there at all. So that's a much better splicer to use than that one. Right, what I'm going to show you now, is the difference between a fine grain duplicating positive, sometimes known as a fine grain duping pos, or just a fine grain and a black and white print. Now, fine grain duping pos, the intention of fine grains are to make dupe negs because they are, are low contrast. And with a low contrast, when you're talking in film terms, you need to have a low contrast to make dupe negs. But the lower contrast is also useful when you're transmitting on television. So if you're actually transmitting a, a print, then you do want a low contrast print. A black and white print is made purely for projection purposes or for viewing purposes. Now, they also are different in two aspects. With the fine grain duping pars, they have what we call negative perforations, or when I say perforations, perfs, some people call them sprocket holes. Now, with the neg perforations, on the fine grain, duping pos, they're actually rounded at the edges and slightly smaller in dimension to the 
perths on the print. Um, the reason being, as I say, that the, the slightly larger perths uh, are better for a print than running through projectors and you get better registration with the neg perths on the fine grain duping paths. Uh, when we come to negatives, there are essentially two types of negs. There are original negatives and dupe negs. Now with an original neg, the neg is shot in the camera and then it's processed and then once it's processed you've got an uncut film which is then cut to the editor's instructions. With a dupe neg, the dupe neg will, won't have any splices in the film at all because it's actually come from an intermediate positive. So if you wanted to tell the difference between a dupe neg and an original neg, or should I say an original cut negative, the original cut neg will have splices at every scene change and there won't be any print through imagery between the perforations, whereas with a dupe neg you won't have any physical splices, you'll probably see print throughs of perforations around the edges of the perfs and you might see print through edge markings that have been printed through from the original or from the print that made the dupe negative. And basically, the dupe neg is the one that uh, can be used uh, to make further copies, but you don't want to wear your original negative out by making copies from that. So the original neg has to be treated with more care, and the dupe neg is the one if you were going to do a large run of copies which would be used. When you see a print on the screen, uh, you will see what is a graded print and that means that all the scenes are correctly graded, that the, the exposures are correct, there's nothing too bright and there's nothing too dark. You know, the shadows aren't too dark that you can't see the detail. But to achieve this, the negative that makes the print has to be graded, because you might have scenes that are overexposed and very heavy, and you might have scenes that are underexposed. Now, to, to grade a negative, to achieve a properly graded print, the lab will, will used to use what were called Lord Eclipse, and these were tiny little clips that went between the perforations and these triggered the printer machine uh, to give the correct exposure so that the print would have a uniform exposure. And these Lordy clips came either side of the perforations. There would be one on one side and then I've removed one on the other. Uh, they have to be removed because if the film is going to tell a cine process and if they're left in the film, they will damage the telecine equipment and you have to take great care when removing these Lordy clips by prizing either a razor blade or a very fine blade and one side you'll see the clip is bent over and you can prize the clip apart and then remove it but when you do be very careful not to damage the actual film especially on the emulsion side because you can scratch it and also be careful not to damage the perfs otherwise you'll have to repair the perfs. The Lordy clips were superseded sometime around, let's say, the 60s. Um, difficult to be exact, but say mid-60s, you had the introduction of what were called light notches. So instead of having these little lordy clip pieces of metal, the side of the film would be cut with a notch, and they would either be eight perf notches, six perf, or four perf notches, and these did exactly the same thing. They would trigger the printer machine to give the correct exposure when making the print. Now there's one disadvantage with the light notches is that if they were cut too close to the perfs, then the perfs would damage when you were running the film. And you'd have to make sure that the perfs were actually in good repair before you sent a film off for duping if it had light notches that had been cut too close. In 2004, it was discovered that some of the BBC News film acquisitions contained nitrate sections. These films had to be removed to a secure vault in the country where the sections were identified and removed and were transferred onto high-definition video. The story of this project starts in 2003, when an operator working on a black-and-white news project came across an original item filmed on nitrate stock. This sparked a search of the archive items around the year in question, which turned up several others. At this point, it was decided to ship a large section of suspect dates to a secure facility for further investigation. A bomb storage bunker, 
specially adapted for storage of this kind of material was found. Approximately 5,000 cans of suspect material were shipped to the bunker and preparations were made for the checking and identification of all remaining nitrate items. The checking system consisted of three discrete processes. First, a visual inspection of the complete reel under UV light, in which dark areas in the reel indicates possible nitrate sections and were highlighted by China Graph pencil. These reels were wound manually across a light source, checking stock identification printed on the edge of the film. Any film that could not be positively identified as safety film had a small sliver cut from its edge and burn tested. All burn tests were conducted in the safe area away from all film stock. If a sliver burned steadily with a smoky orange flame, leaving no residue and gave off an acidic smell, it was identified as nitrate, marked, and the entire can placed in the nitrate vault. Safety film burns with a brighter flickering flame that often goes down of its own accord, leaving a plasticky residue and a strong smell of burning plastic or hair. Many of the items positively identified as nitrate originated in the former Soviet Union, where the use of nitrate stock carried on well into the 60s. Over the five weeks, 5,000 cans were checked and only 45 were found to contain nitrate film stock. These were transferred to HD cam, then the nitrate sections removed and offered to the British Film Institute, or they were disposed of by the Essex Fire Brigade. 